Well, hey, good morning, Storyline. I'm excited to be with you this morning. You know, as we, we saw the weather report and between the news telling people to stay home and the Broncos playing at 11, uh, I kind of expected like 10 people to be here. So glad you're here, and I'm excited to open this book with you this morning. I have to say, I love opening this with you because every time we do, we encounter Jesus Christ. As we read this, the pages come alive, and it's like these aren't just stories, and it's not just ink on a page that that somehow God speaks into our lives from his word. And, And so this morning, I hope that each of us has an encounter with Jesus. And that's the name of this new series that we're starting today called Encounter. And an encounter is an experience, usually unexpected, that we have with something or someone. And so over the next several weeks, we want to look at some different encounters through the book of John where people came face to face with Jesus. And every time that happened, Jesus met them with this unexpected love and compassion, and they walked away with hope. And so here's what we want to see over uh, this morning and the next few weeks, that an encounter with Jesus is an encounter with hope. Now, 10 years ago, there was an encounter that the entire world had with someone who was a nobody and became a somebody. She, she achieved overnight success and became kind of an international sensation. Do you remember this woman? Susan Boyles. I, I love her story. And uh, as she took the stage 10 years ago on the show Britain's Got Talent, she was met with a bunch of laughs and uh, funny looks. And, you know, she began to share with everyone her dream of becoming a singer one day. And she talked about her idols that she wanted to become like, and people laughed even more. Now, in fairness, on these shows, you really never know what to expect, right? Like, does anybody remember William Hung or the pants on the ground guy? I mean, you never know what to expect on this show. Uh, But as everyone looked at her appearance and, and the uninspiring way that she carried herself, they were quickly caught off guard. Because as soon as she opened her mouth and began to sing, Jaws all over the auditorium just dropped. And everyone stared at amazement at this beautiful singing voice that that she has. And it wasn't 30 seconds into her performance that people were on their feet cheering her on. And, And this moment was a shock and inspiration to everyone. Because if we're honest, most of us judge people based on their outward appearance. And we even we even know the saying. You know, don't judge a book by its cover, but we do it all the time, right? And we don't really follow our own advice. Well, the encounter that we will read about today is a story where Jesus does not judge a book by its cover. And when everyone else would look at this certain woman and judge her, Jesus looks at her through a different set of lenses. He doesn't have to judge a book by its cover, by the way, because he he knows everything about everybody all the time, right? So when he looks at her, he knows her, and still he meets her with hope instead of hate. And so I'm excited to look at this story with you. If you have a Bible, feel free to turn with me to the book of John, John chapter 4. And if you don't have one, there's one in front of you, or you can follow along on the screen. And as you're turning there, I'd like to just give a little background to this book for everyone here that's new to the Bible this morning. Now, this book was written by John, who is one of the early followers of Jesus. He wrote the fourth book here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and and John. They were really original and named it after themselves. And and so he wrote this so that people would believe in Jesus. And, and, And so he follows this story of the teaching and the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, John was primarily writing to a Jewish audience. And so all throughout his book, he's constantly showing how God's own people, who should have recognized Jesus when he came, rejected Jesus. But the religious outsiders, or really the less religious, accepted Jesus. And so that tension is what sets up our passage in John chapter 4. 
Now, now, just before this, in the previous chapter, Jesus had this meeting with this guy with a weird name named Nicodemus. There's kind of a picture of it there. And Nicodemus was a Jew. He was a man. He was a religious leader. He was part of the elite. And in the very next chapter, John shows us a story of the complete opposite of Nicodemus. This is a woman. She's not a Jew. She's a Samaritan. And she's not very religious, and she's certainly not part of the elite. She is really a a social outcast. And I love what John's doing here. He puts these right next to each other to highlight one thing, that both of them desperately need Jesus. The religious person is not better off. And so as we come to chapter 4, we see Jesus and his followers are traveling, and they come to this place called Samaria. And so while the disciples are off getting takeout food, we find this encounter in John 4. And I want us to begin in verse 9, or excuse me, 7, and we'll kind of unpack it as we go. So John wrote this. He said, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy takeout. And the Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And John adds this. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now, I can just imagine this scene as Jesus is sitting there on on the well wall, and these pictures never quite uh, really capture the moment. A lot of times they make Jesus white, you know, and and their skin color was much darker than, than lighter, but that's beside the point. But I can just picture this happening where Jesus is sitting there, and this woman comes up to the well, and she's averting her eyes because she doesn't really wants to talk to him. She's not expecting to talk to him. And then Jesus just looks over and starts talking to her. Now, this is really surprising in that day, but you have to understand that there was a deeply embedded hatred between Jews and Samaritans and went back for hundreds of years. And not only was she a Samaritan, but she was a she. She, She's a woman. And, And so in that culture, it was very rare for a man to ever talk to another woman in public even if they were married, which I think is really weird to think about. Like, you would just walk to town and not talk to each other? I I don't know what that looked like. But here she's completely taken by surprise. She says, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. So she's saying, you? Me? We don't go together. We don't talk. We're not friends. This can't be happening right now because Jews didn't associate with Samaritans. And actually, that that phrase that John says is the understatement of the year. And and literally, it actually means that Jews wouldn't share dishes with Samaritans, which really meant that they thought of Samaritans as unclean. In fact, they would actually avoid them at all costs. Even when traveling to Galilee, which is where they're headed, they would try to, to skirt the city and go the long way so they wouldn't encounter a Samaritan. But look at how Jesus treats her here. I want us to see four things, and here's the first one. Number one, Jesus sees her as God sees her. And and I absolutely love this about Jesus because he doesn't feel constrained by the social norms or the prejudices of the day that he looks at her and Jesus sees her for who she is. Now, not only is she a Samaritan and, and not only is she a woman, but she's also alone. In verse 6, we see that this is the middle of of the day. And so we know that it was custom for women to come and to draw water early or late in the day to avoid the heat. But here it's full sun. And so this woman comes after social hour to avoid the other women. And evidently she's been labeled. So just like the character Hester Prynne, she wears this invisible scarlet letter around everywhere she goes. She's marked by shame. I hated that book, by the way. I just have to say that. The Scarlet Letter, we were forced to read in high school, but it fits here because that was like legalistic colonial America, and, and here she's met with that same, those same dirty looks. And so Jesus has every reason to look the other way and avoid the awkward situation. And, and just picture the dividing lines here for why Jesus shouldn't have talked to her. They have different religions, different backgrounds, they're different genders, different ethnicities, And yet Jesus reaches across the aisle. 
One of my favorite movies of all time is Remember the Titans. Is anybody with me there? Man, it is such a good movie. I don't know why they can't make movies this good anymore. But in, in Remember the Titans, the, the story follows the school in the 70s uh, that was forced to racially integrate. And so as you watch it, you see that the town was racially divided, and the school was racially divided, and the football team was racially divided. And, and there was this deep-seated hatred on both sides. And so the new coach, played by Denzel, faced the challenge of trying to bring this team together. And the reason this movie is so powerful is because we're watching these 18-year-old boys learning to leave these labels and stereotypes and social stigmas behind and learning to see each other and to accept each other and to value each other for who they are. And as you watch this movie, you see the impossible happening before your eyes, the way they love and accept each other. And as I read this story of the Samaritan woman, I am floored by the way Jesus loves and accepts her. He sees past the differences, and he sees her. He sees past her religion and past her ethnicity, past her gender, past her baggage, and he loves her anyway. And if we, if we see people like God sees people, then we love people who are different than us. When we begin to see people the way God sees people, then we begin to love people who are different than us. And that doesn't mean that she was perfect. And that doesn't mean that she and, and Jesus agree on everything. In fact, Jesus is about to show her just how far apart they are. But he meets her with compassion, and with mercy, and with hope. And that brings us to number two. Jesus reveals her true thirst. So he asks for a drink. She's shocked. And look at how Jesus answers her surprise in verse 10. It says, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him for a drink, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? And so Jesus tells her that, in fact, she should be asking him for water. And so naturally, she, she looks down at his, at his hands, and he's not holding a jug. There's no aquafina in sight. Like, he doesn't have water. And so she's confused, right? And, and, and rightly so, because this phrase, living water, usually referred to a stream, like moving water. And they're standing next to a well, which, by the way, is still there today. You can go see it. It's still 100 feet deep. It was probably deeper then. And underneath is this spring coming to this well, which supplies it with fresh water. And so she's thinking in natural terms here, Jesus is trying to show her that she has a deeper thirst. So look at verse 13. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She thinks this is a great deal, right? Like too good to be true, in fact. You mean I won't have to keep coming here every single day to drink water? Wow, that's great. Jesus isn't just trying to make life easier for people. He's not just trying to help out a little bit. If that's all he has to offer, that's not good news at all. But, but look at verse 16. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And so Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. And so what you have just said is quite true. So Jesus, like he so often does, puts his finger on the one area of life she would rather not talk about. Now, if, if you're a spiritual explorer here in the room this morning, you might think that is extraordinarily judgmental of Jesus, right? Like, Jesus, why do you have to go there? Why do you have to start bringing all of that up? That's judgy. But here, I, I want you to see what Jesus is actually doing here. Because he's not trying to shame her 
She's already worn down by that, and he's not trying to make her feel guilty. She clearly already has plenty of that because she's ashamed and avoiding people in her town. But Jesus is telling her, in the words of that old country song, that she's looking for love in all the wrong places. But he can provide the one thing that will quench the thirst of her soul. And and so this really is a story of a woman who is at wit's end, who's hit rock bottom, who's husbandless and friendless and hopeless. This reminds me of a verse in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 2, where, where God says this. He says, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me the fountain of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And this verse describes what happens when we try to satisfy ourselves apart from God. And it says, it's kind of like trying to dig a pit, and it's broken, and all it can do is hold this muddy water. And so We drink this muddy water hoping it will quench our insatiable hearts instead of turning to the fountain of living waters. And just the absurdity of that picture of of lapping up muddy water is laughable, and yet every single one of us did that this week. All of us look to something or or to someone to give us hope and to satisfy our souls. And, And you might be like this woman who looks to relationships to try to satisfy her. Or or maybe uh, to feel full and happy, you look to your career or your finances or your hobbies. Or, Or maybe you tend to turn to addictions just to try to relieve the thirst, like alcohol or pornography. According to Jesus, if you look to those things, you will be thirsty again. But if you look to him, you find living water, true fullness, and lasting satisfaction. And that, that is hope. This summer, I I accomplished one of my life goals. And it was a complete disappointment. I don't know if you've ever been there before. Have you ever elevated something in your mind so much that uh, you had these high expectations, and then when it finally happened, it was a total letdown? Well, I'm a, I'm a golfer. I'm not a good golfer. I can barely call myself a golfer. Uh, and I'm, I'm just very average. But my whole life, I've always wanted to hit a hole-in-one. I mean, that's kind of the goal, right? If you play golf, you want to hit a hole-in-one. And, and so you want to have that beautiful shot that arcs up into the air on that par three, and then in slow motion, it drops into the hole, and then all of a sudden, everyone around you starts cheering for you, right? And the people in the holes next to you drop their clubs, and they start giving you the golf clap. All right, that's what I envision in my head. Well, this summer, I hit a hole in one, but it was nothing like that. It, it was kind of awful, actually. I wish it didn't happen. I hit a shot, and it didn't look good. And in fact, uh, I looked for my ball for like 10 minutes after that and couldn't find it. And so I just gave up on the stupid hole. And, and when I went over to, to the flag and pulled it, there it was in the, in the hole. And uh, so we were very confused by that. And, and there was no cheering, and there was no applause, just confusion. <laughs> and to this day, I still think someone from a different hole must have brought my ball over and dropped it in as a joke. But I kept it, because that's what you're supposed to do, right? But every time I look at this thing, it just reminds me of how unsatisfying that experience really was, of how much of a letdown it really was. And to be honest with you, I I do this often in my life. I'll have some goal or or some dream, some accomplishment that I want to achieve, and when I finally reach it, it's never enough. It still leaves me thirsty. I don't know if you can relate to that or not, but it's like the grass is never green enough on the other side. And Jesus here shows this Samaritan woman that there's only one thing that can truly satisfy her soul. Everything else will let her down. And so by putting his finger on what she's hoping in, Jesus is doing the most loving thing he could have done. I think this quote is really helpful from from Chuck Colson. It says this, the gospel must be the bad news of the conviction of sin 
before it can be the good news of redemption. So in other words, before we see the beauty of Jesus, we have to first see the ugliness of our hearts, that we've preferred muddy water instead of the fountain of living waters. And that's what Jesus is helping her to see in this moment. And that brings us to number three. Jesus reveals his true identity. It's like a superhero taking off the mask. Jesus shows her who he really is. Look at verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Now, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we should worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, and that wasn't derogatory, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. So she starts to ask him these, these questions. And I've heard this taught before, like she's trying to switch the subject and, and get away from the uncomfortable, but I actually don't think that's what's happening here. I actually think that she's searching and that this is her one shot to hear from God. Now, Jesus just told her something that only someone sent from God could know, that she had five husbands. And I think she wants God. I think she wants hope. I think she wants to know that her religion counts. And so she starts to ask about worship and who's right. And Jesus answered her and said that the Jew and Samaritan differences aren't near as important as worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Meaning, worshiping him as people who have him living inside and who truly know him. But look at what she says in verse 25. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, that's a title, that's not Jesus' last name, the Messiah, called Christ, is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Now, this is a little ambiguous, but I think she might have a hint that Jesus is more than he's letting on. And I can just imagine her kind of testing the waters here, just throwing this out to see how he'll respond. Well, the Messiah will come one day. Now, I want you to feel the weight of what is about to happen in this moment. It had been 400 years since God last sent a prophet. 400 years since anybody had ever heard from God. And everybody was wondering if God would ever send the Messiah if God would ever come to save them. And now she has found a prophet. And so like Obi-Wan Kenobi, she thinks this prophet is her last hope. And so here on this dusty road, in the heat of the day, Jesus chooses this very unexpected encounter with a very unexpected person to reveal himself as the Messiah for the very first time. And I love this. Look at, what, look at what he says. Then Jesus declared, I, the, the one speaking to you, I am he. Now, this statement is emphatic. In, in, in the Greek, you can't miss it. Jesus says, I am. Those, those infamous words that, that God spoke to Moses out of that burning bush. And so here he's saying he is the Messiah. And he's also saying he's God, Yahweh. And, and, and so he's showing her that he is the one the world's been looking for. He is the one who can change her life. And despite their differences and despite her murky past, God met with her that day and gave her hope. You might be here this morning thinking that, that God could never love you. That your past is too colored. Your mistakes are too great. But I want you to see in this encounter that Jesus sees her and he knows every detail about her life and he loves her. And so even this morning, Jesus sees you and he knows you and he loves you. One of my favorite songs right now is a worship song called His Mercy Is More by a guy named Matt Papa. You should look it up. And I want, to sh I want to show you these lyrics. I think they're so powerful. It says, what love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many. But his mercy 
is more. Now, I don't know, I don't know what you've been through this week, or what decisions you've made, or what struggles you're facing, but maybe this morning you just need to be reminded that you have a lot of sin, a lot of rebellion in your life, and God sees it all. And his mercy is still more for you. His love outweighs every wrong we've ever done. And when we lay our sin at Jesus' feet and we, we trust in that mercy that he bought for us on the cross, we can find forgiveness. And we don't have to carry around that shame and that guilt any longer because his mercy is more. And so this is the story of this woman, that Jesus takes away her shame and he replaces it with living water, with a a lasting hope. And that brings us to number four here, last one. Jesus changes her life. Well, look at verse 27 with me. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? And then, listen to this, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did, could this not be the Messiah? And so they came out of the town and made their way toward Jesus. Now, now notice this. I love how John puts this little detail in here. I mean, he didn't make this up because he wouldn't just add this in. But in her eagerness to receive this new and living water from Jesus, she leaves behind her old water jug. I just love that imagery here. And she runs into the city where she was once ashamed and and avoided people, and now she boldly proclaims that she's found a Messiah. What we see is that her encounter with Jesus resulted in a complete 180 in her life because she goes from ashamed to accepted, from hopeless to hopeful because an encounter with Jesus is an encounter with hope. Now, now for some of us in this room, we've forgotten what that initial excitement was when we first came to know Jesus. I mean, I was seven years old when I, when I first trusted in Jesus to be my Lord. And, and I know there's times in my life, and I would guess there's probably times in your life, where we just forget what that was like. And so I just want to read this quote to you that I think so well describes the experience of that moment and what happened. This is from John Piper. Look at what he says. Once we had no delight in God, and Christ was just a vague historical figure. And we enjoyed many things, but not God. He was an idea, even a good one, and a topic for discussion, but he was not a treasure or delight. And then something miraculous happened. It was like the opening of the eyes of the blind during the golden dawn. First, the stunned silence before the unspeakable beauty of holiness. Then the shock and terror that we had actually loved the darkness. But then the settling stillness of joy that this is the soul's end. I love this. The quest is over. We should give anything if we might be granted to live in the presence of this glory forever and ever. And then faith. Have you ever ever experienced that? Where all of a sudden, unexpectedly, it all made sense. It was like someone turned on the lights and you saw everything clearly for the very first time. And that's what's happening in this encounter with Jesus. She was completely changed. And I want us to see how the story ends here. Verse 39, it says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. And they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the savior of the world. You see, when when real life change happens, we can't help but talk about it. 
And that's what she was doing here. And, and, and so these others from the town might have believed her, but once they had their own encounter with Jesus, they came to see him as the savior of the world. And so this morning, I, I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to have your own encounter with Jesus. And I hope you see in this passage that, that we don't have to clean ourselves up before coming to God. We're simply supposed to surrender and believe. One, one detail about this story that I absolutely love is that while she was searching, Jesus was actually seeking her out the entire time. And I mentioned earlier that a lot of religious Jews would actually skirt around Samaria just to avoid them. But Jesus didn't do that. He knew she'd be there, and he pursued her. And so I don't know what brought you here this morning on this snowy day during the Broncos game. But what I do know is that you're not here by accident. That God is seeking after you, and he wants you to encounter him so that you see that only he can satisfy and so this morning, just like this woman, you, you have a decision to make. Either you can walk away trusting in, in Jesus as your Lord and find the satisfaction, or you can walk away unchanged, rejecting him because you don't think you need him. If, if you're at a place where, where you're ready to make that decision, and by no means do we want to pressure you into that. But if you want to make that decision, I just want to say I would love to meet you at the fireplace after this. And our entire staff team would love to get coffee with you, to talk with you, because we would love nothing more than to help you meet Jesus. Well, in our last few minutes here, I, I want to ask three questions that other people might ask. We like to do this here at Storyline from time to time. And I think this helps us see how this really matters in our lives. So here's the first question. A skeptic might ask or say, surprise, surprise, you're trying to convert me. Don't you think it's closed-minded to think you Christians are right and the rest of us are wrong? I think that's a good question. And I, I just want to say, that's you in the, in the room this morning, I feel you here. And cards on the table, we absolutely do want you to come here and hear about Jesus and give your life to him unashamedly. We, we want that to happen. And there's really two reasons for that. Now, first, if we didn't want that, then clearly we don't really believe what we say we believe, right? I mean, we'd be even bigger hypocrites than what most people imagine. And then the second reason is that if Jesus really is this soul-quenching, satisfying fountain of living waters, if he really does change our lives, then can you blame us for wanting to spread this as much as we possibly can? Because if we weren't, then we don't believe it, and it hasn't happened. So if there's any truth in this book at all, then we would do everything it takes to help others come to know Christ. Here's the second question. A student asks, how should I treat others at my school who live in a way I disagree with? I think this is such an important question today. We live in a very diverse world with a lot of different preferences and a lot of different beliefs. And I think this passage shows us exactly how Jesus would treat people at your school who are different than you. I, I think he would see past what he disagrees with and show love and compassion. And what I see in this story is that Jesus does not let a label define this woman in John 4 because her identity does not lie in her skin tone or her gender or her sexuality or her religious beliefs. Her identity is fixed in the image of God. She bears God's fingerprints. And, and, and so that alone means she's worthy of love and compassion and respect. Now, for the rest of us in the room this morning, myself included, I just want to ask a really challenging question here. Do you have trouble seeing past the differences? Whether it's someone's skin color or religious beliefs or political parties or past life decisions or maybe even just something as simple as their appearance, do you have a hard time seeing past the differences? My fear is that we actually struggle with this a lot more than we even realize. 
that we have blind spots here that we're not even, not even aware of. But Jesus sets a precedent here that, that those things don't define a person that cr- being created in the image of God does. And so to answer the question, we treat others around us with love and with respect and with care and with concern. And as we build relationships with people, we point them to Jesus. Because Jesus came to save people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And lest we, lest we forget, Jesus came to die for the whole world, not just a preferred group. Third and last question. A seasoned Christian might ask, doesn't Paul say I shouldn't even eat or associate with such sinful people? I think that's a hard question here. They're referring to a verse in 1 Corinthians 5 that says this, but now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or swindler, Do not even eat with such people. And these are really strong words from Paul, aren't they? And and they're they're given to members of the church in Corinth to to help protect the reputation of Christ in that community. And and by the way, this is one of the places that we see in Scripture and in the early church where church membership was happening. And so they're told to avoid people living in sin. But... Let's be clear here. Let's look at what he's actually saying. He's not talking about just anyone. He's talking about those who claim to be a brother or sister in Christ. And yet their lives show no sign of them wanting to leave sin. So so in other words, if someone claims to follow Christ, but everything in their life says otherwise, then you should treat them like those outside the church. You should treat them like someone who doesn't believe. Now, that might sound really judgy, but hang on. How should we treat people who don't believe? Well, we should love them, right? We should see them as God sees them and love them as Christ loves them. We should love our neighbor as ourselves. And so the heart behind this verse is for restoration, not retribution. It is so that people would truly come to know and believe in the gospel. And I think Jesus shows us how to do that. Every single one of us needs the hope that Jesus offers because for all of us, for all of us, our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. Would you, would you pray with me? God, we're so grateful today that you brought us here. And God, I don't even know who you've brought here in the room this morning. But God, I know that we all need hope, and we all need you. And God, I just pray that that today you would just show us our deep thirst. God, would you show us the places in our lives that we're lapping up muddy water, and we should just put it to rest and instead turn to you, the fountain of living water. God, would you satisfy us? Would you quench our thirst And God, as we see others around us, would you help us to see past the differences and to love them the way that you love them? God, we're so grateful that you sent Jesus to this earth 2,000 years ago to die on a wooden cross for us so that we can have this forgiveness and we can taste this living water. And so God, would you remind us that our sins are many, but your mercy really is more. That's in Jesus' name we pray together.